Hello everyone and welcome back to part 3 of my series on early photography for customers and people who just want to know more about early photography. This series is a part of CocoVid, a interactive online conference weekend from July 30th to August 2nd. It's got a ton of YouTube videos coming out as well as some other interactive like Instagram things. So I've linked the program below, go check it out. I've also linked a ton of other things in the description below. Part of the CoCoVid weekend though is this interactive ribbon badge game and I will be sharing the QR code and link for this badge at some point in my video. So watch it all to find out when I put it in. Part one of my series, if you missed it, is all about daguerreotypes as well as a bit about my background as a photographer. Yesterday I told you all about amrotypes, tintypes, and wet plate collodion as well as some really important things to remember when looking at early photographs. I highly recommend going and checking out those other two videos. I have put all these videos in a playlist for you, so go check those out as well once this video is done. Tomorrow I'm going to have the last video in the series coming out and it's going to be about early paper prints, carte physiques, cabinet cards, and stereo cards. Today I'm going to discuss cases, magic lanterns, and an easy early process to try your hand in in case you really want to try early photography now. I wanted to talk about cases because I really love them. And this series is basically an ode to my love of early photography. I collected my cases a few years ago. I have a small collection. I have a few more than this. I got most of them from eBay. A couple friends gave me. A couple I made. Mine all range from like $9 to about $60. You can get ones for way more than that. Some of the really fancy and rare ones are quite expensive, but there's a lot of common and smaller ones that you can find for cheap. There are three main types of cases. Wood ones, which can be covered in leather, paper, or fabric. These are called traditional cases. There's union cases, and there are non-traditional cases, which cover everything else. Most of my cases are traditional ones, they're what I was most interested in collecting at the time because they're the kind that I learned how to make. Traditional cases are a little bit more affordable to buy. They have the embossed paper or leather. Sometimes they're a little bit hard to tell if it's paper or leather. You can kind of guess by the feel. This one is paper. This one I think is leather. They're typically embossed quite fancy, but not always. They most commonly have a little hook and eye to close them, although sometimes they have a push button. I don't have any of those examples, but I do have this one with a different kind of latch. Union cases have a lot of misconceptions around them. People often today say that they're made of gutta percha. They're not made of gutta percha. They're made of thermoplastic. Union cases aren't named such for any association with the Union Army. They predate the Union Army by about eight years. They're called such because thermoplastic is made of a union between gum shellac, sawdust, and dye. When Union cases came out, they're more popular for high-end photographs, and traditional cases kind of fell to the more low-end side. Traditional cases have a lot of different designs on them. We've got flowers. This one has two different designs. Geometric. Lots of geometrics, lots of flowers, but there's a lot of different designs. Uh, this is just some of what my selection is. Here's that daguerreotype I bought because I really liked its case. It has a sailboat with a tiny flag that says Susan. Union cases have a deeper design to them. They have a whole variety of different things as well. The ones that I have are kind of an agrarian theme. I got a beehive. Thistles, strawberries. There's a ton of different designs. There's people in them, there's chips, there's all kinds of things. Union cases are a little bit more delicate. You can see that this one broke at some point in its life, so be pretty careful with them. Traditional ones are a little bit more sturdy, but often their hinges break at some point in their life. Very common to find someone that Repaired this one with like duct tape at some point. Not the best, most archival idea. Union cases, as I mentioned, are a bit more collectible than traditional ones. 
oftentimes the case has more value than the photograph does. Sean Nolan, author of the fabulously detailed book Fixed in Time, a guide to Dane daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, and tintypes by their mats and cases for historians, genealogists, collectors, and antique dealers, reckons as many as 40% of Union cases no longer house their original photographs. So keep that in mind when you're looking at photographs and trying to date them. Dating them by their case and mats is a handy way to get sort of in the, in the time range, but people did move them around a lot. The insides of Union cases and traditional cases both look pretty similar. Typically, on one side they have a pad that is often embossed velvet. Some are simpler than others. Sometimes there's no embossing. Oftentimes they're flowers or geometric shapes. This one has a sort of urn of some kind. Sometimes you get cases that are double images though. Around the image itself there is a mat and a preserver. The mats have a wide range of what they're like. Some are simple, some are more complex. Some early ones, especially around daguerreotypes, are very simple. Mats either go under the cover glass or on top of it. It varies. This one, the mat is on top of the cover glass. This one, the mat is underneath the cover glass. Preservers are what this piece of metal is called. It wraps around to the back of the image and it holds them all together. The earliest case photographs did not have a preserver. And again, they started out kind of simple and progressed to very ornate. The image with the mat, with the cover glass, with the preserver all wrapped around it is held inside the case by a sort of velvet pad around it. And then it just has some tension to keep it into the case. Occasionally behind the image there's some information. This photograph is dated October 4th, 1855. It's got some more writing on it that I can't read. But now I know how old this guy is. Check out that bow tie. Oftentimes too on this area behind the image there'll be the maker's mark of who made the case or some more writing. Behind this boy is some more writing but I can't read it. Sometimes it's just plain too. I have seen an occasion where people have like tucked something behind the image, like a little secret image. Daguerreotypes and wet plate images came in standard sizes. This size, eight and a half by six and a half, is a whole plate. This is one that I shot of John Coffer's cabin. From the whole plate came the half plate, and then the quarter plate, sixth plate, down to ninth plate, and even the teeny tiny 16th plate and although if you remember there is the even smaller gem size. Most of my cases are ninth plates. They're the ones that I got for nine dollars or pretty cheap. Sixth plate is also fairly easy and common to get. Once you get up to half plate they're a lot more expensive to collect. Whole plate is like pretty rare and really expensive to collect. I do really love the 16th though. It's just so tiny. There's a few people who make reproduction cases today. One company makes them more kind of like union cases. They make molds of a lot of the union cases and make them out of sort of resin, I believe. Their velvet pads are just plain and the mats are made of a sort of plasticky resin. They're not metal and I don't believe they have preservers. This is a case that I made. It's embossed. It's quarter plate size. Made some hooks and eyes to go with it. I embossed a velvet pad. Then it's got a metal preserver and mat. It's a portrait of me and John Coffer. I really love case making. It involves several of my interests, including woodworking, fibers, and photography, as well as really obscure stuff that no one's going to appreciate all the amount of work that goes into. I also I really want to start making cases again, but I'm missing a few tools. Hopefully someday I'll be able to make really beautifully embossed ones on my own. Right now I can make plain leather ones. Okay. I think that using cases as an interpreter could be a fun prop and talking point. 
if you find one that is affordable and in pretty good condition, you can have it in your pocket and pull it out and be like, this is my sister. She left to go west, but luckily she got this ambrotype made before she left. I miss her dearly, but she's making a new life out there for herself. You can explain like why people would have left to go west or if you're in the west you can say this is you know my family back home i came west i came from boston to make a new life and this is like why i decided to move it'll be a good like little prop to keep in your pocket and talk make conversations with people about explain about like oh this is my sister she died of whatever illness, maybe you know a lot about different illnesses of the 1850s and you want to, to bring that up as a talking point. Something I love to think about when I'm looking at case images is how whoever's photograph it is held this in their hands. Because of the way the photo process is done, because you go into the studio and pretty soon after you get the actual plate, the person who had their photo taken would have, after the sitting, gotten it and looked at it and held it in their hands. Look at this photo. How old do you think that woman is? Maybe like 80? This case dates to 1861 or 1862, so that would put her birth around 1780. I don't have any information about who she is. So I don't know if she lived in America her whole life or if she came across at some point in her life. But just think about that. This woman who was born in the 1700s held this in her hands. It's pretty amazing that I can like, I mean, you get old stuff and you know that people from the past held them. But to actually see the person who owned this and held it, I think it's really cool. This woman Maybe she's 90. Maybe she was a child during the Revolutionary War. Her parents could have fought in the Revolutionary War. Or she came across on a boat later. Just to be able to look at her and think about her getting this photo taken, it's pretty amazing. Think about how treasured and special these images were. To have a photo of your loved ones who may have left or you may have moved away, you potentially are never going to see them again in your life. Today, photographs in the digital world, they get shot and then they're never really looked at again. Or you look at them for a second on Instagram and scroll past them again later. I love looking at these images and thinking about the person who had them taken. To think about getting ready to get your photograph taken for the first time, picking out your outfit, deciding what you're gonna wear, how you wanna do your hair and what accessories you wanna wear. To think about how they're kind of nervous or excited about getting their photo taken for the first time. Then going to the studio and sitting down in front of the camera and trying to sit still for long enough of the image. And then to go and wait while your image is being processed and get to pick out a case what you want your image to be housed in. And then to see yourself, see a photograph of yourself for the first time ever and be like, is that really what I look like? And then to give it to someone who you love, for them to slip it in their pocket and keep it close, to have it be one of the few things that they move around with them, to have it be put on a place of importance on their mantle or shelf, for them to look at every day and think about you, and then for them to pass it on to their kids who pass it on to their kids, who forget who you are, and then you just get put in a box and put in the attic for the next hundred years, to then be put up on eBay, and for someone like me, a hundred and sixty years later, to get your image and to spend, sit there and look at it and think about it and wonder who you are. I think that's pretty amazing. Can you say a photograph of you is gonna do that? We have thousands of photographs taken of ourselves, but what's the most recent one that you could easily grab a print of? I have some self-portraits of myself because I was in a photo class that involved printing. The next most recent image of myself that I can easily grab is my wedding portrait because it is a tintype. All my other wedding photographs 
from three years ago, we haven't even printed them yet. I have photo albums from when I was a kid because I still grew up in the film age, but I don't know if those are gonna last another 150 years without fading away and not being able to be seen. That's why these photographs are so amazing. I hope one day to have case images of all my family members. I think they're a really beautiful and special item to hold onto and to have. Like this photograph captures a moment in his life. It's not just a sixteenth of a second, it's seconds. Maybe a minute of his life. There. It's amazing to look into the eyes of these people and think about what it was like for them to get their photo taken. Sometimes it's not the best method to use the cases to date your photographs as they could have been moved around, but it is a good way to get some clues about when it is from. There's a couple of good books on it. This one, Cased Images and Tintypes Quick Guide, a guide to identify and dating daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, and tintypes. It's pretty basic, but it's a good beginner's guide. Not everything can be held as gospel because everyone makes mistakes and everyone's always learning and improving their knowledge. His base of photographs that he uses to come up with all this information isn't the largest, but the book does have some great photographs. It's all in color. He talks about the different maps. He has lots of different examples which show clear photographs. That can just be fun to look at. He talks about tintypes in paper like I showed you yesterday. He even says a little bit about beginner's guide to dating on fashion or hair and neckwear. It's kind of like just a fun guide to look at too because it gives you a little basic about photography, early photography. It gives you lots of good clear images to look at. Another one worth mentioning is Sean Nolan's Fixed in Time that I mentioned earlier. It's available online or as a print copy. I haven't gotten myself a print copy yet, but you can just download it as a PDF if you want to send him some money for a pastry. His book goes into very great detail, but from what I, the parts that I've read of it, it's a pretty fun read. There are a couple of other books that hardcore case collectors use as well. They're definitely on my list of books to get, and I will link them in the description as well. Here's your ribbon code. Hopefully by now you appreciate and love cases just a little bit more. So let's move on to another topic that I want to bring up. Magical lanterns. How can you not be fascinated with a name like that? I don't know a whole ton about them, but they were kind of like an early slide projector. They even predate photography, but we're gonna talk about them as a photographic thing. They're often used for educational purposes, and I wanted to mention them as a place for people to look when they want to see other images besides just a white person in a studio. There were a number of expeditions into other parts of the world where people would go and shoot magic lantern slides, which would then be brought back, reproduced, and given, like, people would go and give lectures about them, about what the topic was, like Jerusalem or Switzerland. I don't sound like it, but I'm from Scotland. I've just lived most of my life stateside. And last year I went and was showing my husband's family around Scotland. And we went to the Outer Hebrides and on the ferry, I found this awesome book. Destination, St. Kilda. From Oban to Sky in the Outer Hebrides, the Magical Lantern Lectures of George Washington Wilson and Norman MacLeod, edited by Mark Butterworth. This is what a magic lantern looks like. This is a collection of magic lantern slides from, as you might have guessed, when these people went to St. Kilda's. But it has a lot of good reproductions of photographs that they took of people, just regular people, doing their daily lives. Because it was also a lecture series, they reproduced the notes from them, so they tell you a lot more information about like what's going on in the image and sometimes even who's in them. They're a pretty good way to get some views of people that you might not normally get, see what's going on. 
They're also good examples of the coloring that people would sometimes do on images. Magic Lantern slides were often hand colored, so we would just sit there and color them all in. They also have a lot of good landscape shots. So here's Barra, the island that we were on. It doesn't look like that anymore. So if you're researching a specific area or topic, it could be worthwhile looking for some Magic Lantern slides of that place. An obscure society that I used to be a member of, which might help you, is called the Magic Lantern Society. They are very enthusiastic about magic lanterns and have a very academic article newsletter that comes out. But you might be able to contact them and see if they know of any magic lantern slides of the areas that you're looking for. Hopefully by this point you're like, man, early photography is the coolest. I want to try some. Well, the easiest process to start getting involved with at home is the cyanotype. It dates from the 1840s. And unlike these other processes we were talking about earlier that need to be shot on camera, cyanotypes are a photogram, which means you just put something onto the piece of paper or fabric which is coated with cyanotype chemicals, put it out in the sun, and then development, you just put it in water and wash it in water. You may have done this process as a kid, a lot of like science, it's kind of like a sciencey project to do with kids for fun. It looks kind of like this. These are from one of my friends who does a lot of cyanotypes, Linda Stemmer. Some ferns on the paper, or you can put like doilies with lace things, a feather. Cyanotypes are blue, hence the name, although you can tone them to be other colors. I don't have any examples of the ones that I've done in the past because I just recently moved house and I don't know where they are right now. But you can also make them by using a digital negative or a regular negative and putting that on the paper and exposing it and then you get more like a photograph. Again, it's blue unless you tone it. One of the cool things about this process is that the first book using photographic images in it was published by a woman named Anna Atkins. She made a book on the photography of British algae in which she made prints of seaweed. They're really beautiful though. She did every print by hand, made several portfolios of it. You can find some books that are re that reproduce her work. The New York Public Library recently did a show of her work and so they reprinted this book recently. Sanotypes are really fun. They're really beautiful. What, like The Pantone color of the year right now is basically cyanotype blue so they're quite on style right now. You can either do them on paper or fabric. I've made a couple of quilts using them before. I have a t-shirt. I made this t-shirt like almost five years ago now and I just wash it in my regular laundry so some of the feathers their details have been washing out but and the colors kind of shifted a little bit but it's a pretty fun process and good to try with kids. Of course, I will link information down below. One more image I want to share from you from this book is this one. Of a woman from 1853 leaning out her window to make a print in the sun. I think that's about it that I wanted to cover today, so let's go ahead and wrap this video up here. Remember, I'll be back tomorrow, same bat time, same bat channel, to talk all about early paper images such as carte physiques, cabinet cards, and stereo cards. Leave me a comment and tell me what you think about all this. Do you have like encased images of your own? And have you ever done cyanotypes or other early processes? Don't forget to subscribe and be sure to go check out the other CoCovid offerings. There's a lot of them and it's very exciting. I'll talk to you later. Bye bye. Then going to the studio and trying to sit still for long enough for the image. Thank you, Fridge.